Let's get this started. Right? All right, hey guys, here with Joe and Melissa. I'm uh, gonna have them talk a little bit about brumation with you. Uh, it's one of those subjects that I don't really know anything about. Uh, so I figured it'd be interesting to share with other people and since they know, uh, they will help the, uh, you guys learn. So what do you have there? So this here is Pituophis ruthveni or the Louisiana pine snake. We produced this guy this year they actually come out about the size of ball pythons eating adult mice right out of the egg. So really unusual colubrid. And I kind of wanted to show, this is uh, <laughs> Canis lupus, right? Yeah. Is that the correct? <laughs> there you go, this is our dog Dixie. She'll be in brumation next week. <laughs> so so the Louisiana pine snake's actually a federally enlisted, yeah, federally enlisted endangered species. Dixie's really getting me off my game here. Well, yeah, get her out of here. Get that <laughs> yeah. <on. laughs> so pine snakes don't like very sudden movements or being hit with dog tails. So let's try to keep these things separate. <laughs> but these are all North American colubrids. And colubrids, as people know, there's pythons, there's boas, there's vipers, there's elapids. And then there seems to be this catch-all group, which is colubrids, which can really have a whole bunch of snakes that seemingly have no relation with each other whether they have rear fangs or it's kind of a catch-all but dan has a cool florida king snake another animal that we produced and uh, as you can see a little bit of a different same age a little bit of a different size uh, and then melissa has our retired breeder corn snake i don't know where she went straddling the dog <laughs> but everything's pretty much kept the same which i think is super convenient if you're into if you're in the snake and you want to have a bunch of different species, I mean, it's so easy just to have a room or even a rack that's 85 degree hotspot and then regular room temperature would be the ambient. Or if you run ambient like I do, you know, 80 to 82 degrees ambient and everything can stay in there and everything. Oh. Did he pee on you? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Ah, uh, so Paper lots of the man. Oh, I just lost It's all right. Head. I've been, no, it's good. I've been peed on before. <laughs> I'm going to survive. I just surprised I felt something touching my leg. I'm like, what the hell is down there? There you go. I don't know if that's like more of a fast metabolism thing because he's moving around so much or more so that uh, he's a little nervous. Yeah. Probably a little bit of both. But uh, yeah, that's part of the fun, especially with young colubrids. They tend to let themselves lose quite, lose quite a bit. They also will give out a good pungent musk every once in a while and that will stick with you. Things like corn snakes are typically, you know, very good as far as that comes. They barely get mussed by corn snakes, but you know, some of the rarer stuff or some of the stuff that may be more flighty, you know, you may have a little bit more opportunity of that. Um, I wanted to talk about when we decide to brew me. Yeah. We always, um, I just kind of follow you because I started dating you and in my world, you know everything about snakes. But I know a lot nice. of people. You shouldn't tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> now you're gonna. <laughs> Guys, I know everything about snakes. I right? Okay, when, you, when you're someone who knows nothing, you know, <laughs> I just took all my advice from you, and I know that we brewmate from about Thanksgiving to Valentine's Day, but I don't know why, and other people brewmate at different times, so can you talk a little bit about that? I think that that's what was done in the hobby or just in the industry forever. It was Thanksgiving to Valentine's Day, and then that became the standard, and then people were like, oh, let's get in front of people and let's do it earlier. So I feel like people's shift in brumation. I feel like now I always see people going in more October and coming out even in January. Wow. And yeah, and I feel like that's just a competition thing. Just and money. Makes sense. I mean, I wasn't going to say just money, but it's <laughs> nice to have your animals out before everyone else because, yeah. because they're so seasonal that around this time of year, you'll start to see that everyone's sold out. So you're going to have a much better chance of selling them if you get them out early. So that's just something that that breeders do now, but I still do. Uh, I still do Thanksgiving to Valentine's Day. It seems to work. You know, most people have a little space in their schedule. Definitely Thanksgiving and then uh, Valentine's Day. A lot of snake people have a lot of time on Valentine's Day. Definitely. Every year, you're there wiping away the tears, bringing yeah. the snakes out of brumation. Absolutely, it helps with the humidity at that time of year. You know? it's really important. <laughs> So that's just, it just gives you an easy, okay. an easy timeline. Yeah. And so some people are super particular about bringing them down or bringing them up. So 
I don't really do anything special. I don't do uh, I don't do a big cool down as far as I'll go straight from their room up there. I'll bring them out into the hallway. They may stay out in the hallway for like 24 hours. Which the hallway is going to be 70 degrees. And then I'm going to bring them down to the basement, which is going to be fluctuating between 50 and 60. And now like the cold isn't that big of an issue as far as it doesn't matter if they get small periods of warmer temperatures, not the biggest deal. Small, small uh, time increments at lower temperatures, not that big of a deal. Um, we, we had a heater malfunction actually when we lived in Texas of all places. Right. People don't know that Dallas gets cold. They think Texas, oh, it's the South. It's super warm. We had multiple days in the twenties in Dallas and we had a little space heater that couldn't catch up always. Yeah. Because we were used to keeping it. We were used to keeping it for brumation when it was about 40 degrees. All of a sudden it went to 20 space heater in, uh, you know, the circuit went. Yeah. And then... It just couldn't handle, uh, pumping for that long because I wasn't used to it. But then the weird thing about Dallas is it go from 20 degrees, next day is 60 degrees. And it was just very, very confusing. Um, thankfully we had a shed right outside our apartment in Dallas so we could easily like go and check on it and everything and see how it was. And we had some blankets in there uh, just to kind of insulate it a little bit more. And I think that's the, that's kind of the hard part about brumation people who have North American colubrids it's that they don't know what space of their house gets a certain mm -hmm. temperature. So it's like, it's always going to be a shuffle. And people always ask us, hey, I'm looking to brume. Like, where do I put it? Like, I don't know, man. You got to, you have to. You need to go sleep outside or in a cold, the coldest part of your area of your house. Sleep out there for 24 hours. Try to, you know, <laughs> you have to take your heat. If, if you have a draft, an older house with a drafty window, yeah. that may work just as well as putting them down in the basement. It just... You know, it just kind of depends on how your house runs and, uh, yeah, so it's different for everyone. This is an old drafty house, not too hard to find a way to get <laughs> a them cold down. spot. In Texas, we had to pretty much have them almost outside. It's an outdoor closet. It was yeah. almost outside. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't keep them, but I have uh, this little room down in my basement, which we just call the mongoloid room, which is a long story. But it's, I mean, it's literally like a quarter of the size of your living room is like this random room, but it's enclosed. So my basement will get down, you know, on a really cold day, it'll get down into like the, the high thirties or low forties, but that room stays just a little bit warmer. So mm -hmm. that would probably be the type of place where I could do yeah. it there. Um, I don't see myself diving into a lot of colubrids. I like them, but I, I also like my Python stuff and kind of that's where I see my myself staying, but that would be my space in the house where, you know, I could do something like that. Yeah, I think I think the hard brumation is what separates colubrid guys from python guys from intermingling as much. So it's yeah. like I I won't mess with pythons as much because the seasons are a little bit conflicting and the the temperature changes are conflicting. So it's like yeah. I've got these I've got these settled in, so I'm going to stick with that. I know how to do this and I got everything figured out. And I feel like uh, Python guys are often the same thing. They're like, I'm not used to bringing snakes down to 55. Yeah. I think I'm just gonna well, stay Well, it's in even, my way. even weird going from the short tails into some of the Australian stuff because like the short tails, like I said, you really don't drop temperature much at all. It's like a little bit of a natural thing in the winter where you get a couple of degree separation. But like the Australian stuff has to get like so drastically mm -hmm. cold compared. And even with that, even within the Pythons, it's difficult. So I can imagine having to go a step further is, is you know, you need way more square footage than I have in order to <laughs> accommodate all those different environments. You know, I'm having enough trouble just getting the Aussie stuff cold enough. Um, so I, I couldn't imagine. Yeah, it's like hopefully you have a quarantine room and you have a main snake room and then and then you're talking about maybe adding a python room, a colubrid room, and a quarantine room. <laughs> An and incubation then, yeah. room. All <laughs> these that's things. why I joke. I'm up to two snake rooms now and uh, the second room I call Snake Room West. I just feel like, <laughs> you know, I have like a winning over there, even though my house is Feels like 950 here. square feet. <laughs> yeah. So there's the main Snake Room and then Snake Room West. And then I have some stuff in the living room that really needs to get cooler. Since I like it cooler too, it works out. You know, I keep my house like 64 and then I have them low level away from the heat. So it's probably, you know, high 50s, low 60s there. And then I just give them their little hot spot. And that's the thing I think that separates like you know, true brumation from like the Aussie stuff. Like the Aussie stuff will get down to a similar temperature, but you're still warming them up during the day and giving right. them that hot mm -hmm. spot. You know, you're just really dropping them at night, whereas these are constant over the course of time. 
Yeah, so when they when they go into brumation, they're literally just saying that 50 to 55, you're changing their water, you're not feeding them. Right. You know, you're trying to mess with them as little as possible. I didn't they're, even know you changed their water. How often yeah. are you changing their water? Oh, very infrequently. I'll yeah. look and see if anything's... Cloudy. You know, like probably... Technically, you know, someone's gonna say maybe every week, but probably more like once a month. I mean, they're not doing anything. I don't think they're drinking, but you'll see every once in a while you'll get one that sheds, or you get one that'll move around a little bit, or you have a little unseasonably warm day, and they may move around quite a bit, or maybe they're gonna walk or knock over their water bowl. So you wanna be attentive, but you also don't wanna be so attentive that you're always Messing bothering them. them, yeah. Now you said that you just drop them down a lot on the beginning side. Do you see any um, influence on when you bring them out of brumation, like warming them up slowly or just kind of bringing them back into their normal ambient temperature? So that's another one of those things where it's like people, people want to drop slow and people want to bring up slow, but I don't really do that to be honest. And most of the people that I know, the first couple of years of breeding, you know, they did it to where when they bring them up from brumation, they come from 55 to 50 to 60. And then they're like, oh, and then I keep them at 65. And then in two to three days, I bring them up to 70. And then another two to three days, I bring them to 75. And then give them a few years and they're like, oh, screw it. I go right from the basement <laughs> right up to the snake room and everything's all well, good. You think about it too, like, you know, from a natural standpoint, you know, we all have those days where all of a sudden in March, it's like 80 degrees mm -hmm. randomly. And then it might drop back down and back up. So, you know, they're kind of built for pretty serious fluctuations, I would think, you know. Oh, yeah. And even if you talk, like, within the species of the corn snake, the corn snake is all the way, ranges all the way from New Jersey to the Florida Keys. And there's yeah. such, range of, such a range of temperature there. And then there's some volatile temperatures here on the East Coast. Like, yeah, like, like what you said in April or something, it will change from summer to winter every yeah. which way. Yeah, in like and a day. They, <laughs> and they wake up and they go out. And you can find if you're herping, there's an unseasonably warm day. doesn't matter what month it is. You know, these animals will come up and try to get a meal. And it's like, if, if, I, feed, if I feed an animal a meal and then cool it down the next day, it will probably regurge and die. I don't know how they do it in the wild. Yeah, but. yeah I think just overall, I, I think as far as how we keep you know, we, we baby everything, which is good, and I think it also makes them more susceptible sometimes to stuff, whereas the wild counterparts are getting assaulted all the time with bacteria, with all this different stuff, with temperature changes, so they're just built for it a little bit better. Um, because, yeah, I, you know, it's not like I see wild snakes regurging all the time. Usually the only time you see that is if somebody stresses them out or agitates them to where they're just trying to get away. Right. Um, you know, and I've rehabilitated a couple of wild snakes and, you know, fed them a meal or two before I sent them back out and they all eat and do fine. And Isn't that funny? You can literally take like a rat snake of almost any kind and then yeah. it will literally just eat a mouse pinky like without mm -hmm. any thoughts. Yeah. No, I mean, I had um, this one, these, these people had gotten in touch with me. It was stuck in two of those glue traps. Ooh. And then the person was like panicked and threw it into their recycling bin. So now it was stuck to all oh of the recycling. Oh so I had, it, oh I had it on my kitchen table, like with all the mineral oil. And I'm slowly trying to get this thing loose. And with each piece of it that I got loose, like it's trying to kill me, of course, because it's freaked out. But I finally got it loose, but it had so much goop on it that I kind of like soaked it in like a mineral oil bath after. Right. And then I just kept it in a tank in my house for like two days you know, after that, and then I offered it food, and it, it took food, like, yeah, hey. Like, like a great. python probably wouldn't eat for a month. No. It's so stressed out, it, like, This thing was like, oh, cool, will little, little rat, I'm on it, you know? <laughs> it just ate it, and it was all good. Yeah, and that's really, that's why I always, I always suggest, like, colubrids to first-time pet owners. I mean, yeah. they, the temperature fluctuations, the humidity fluctuations, I mean, they're just solid. Yeah. Now, you know, this might sound stupid, but I don't even know, but like, can a corn snake even get like a, a respiratory infection type thing? Does that even happen? I would imagine you really have to Oh, you mess really got it. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, like, and she's been with me, you know, this whole time. And, and I say this all the time that I have kept corns for now since first grade. And listen, I, I haven't had numbers of them until I was, say, 21 or so. Yeah. But, but... I've never had an RI, and I guess that's like knock that's on like, wood type of thing. Yeah, yeah but like I mean, the I've same never thing with, with ball pythons. Like I, I kept them for a long time, and I never had one. I've had many RIs in ball oh, pythons. Yeah, <laughs> that problem with that, but 
Um, it's weird, like working in rescue work too. Like you see these ones come in all the time. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? Like, you know, they always seem bomb proof to me, but in your case, I think there was something else going on with those ones. Mm -hmm. I really don't think that was your run of the mill RI. Yeah, it's a, it's something that I'm sure it happens in corn snakes, but it would have to be their immune system so shot. They must be, Yeah. there must be some other ailment going on. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, when we say respiratory infection, I mean, that's such a general well, term. Yeah, it's a common cold type thing yeah. for us. You know, it could mean so many different things. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, I had a question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, another thing I feel like with brumation, a lot of people talk about, like, do you just put your animals that you're breeding into brumation or do you start mm. from a baby, especially with corns? I mean, that's just because we work with, we get that question a lot. And I always guess when I'm answering people, I'm like, oh, let's see what I feel like saying today. But you definitely have the better answer. Yeah, it's, it's weird to explain to people and it's really confusing to talk about brumation because they're like, oh, it's clearly this is natural. So of course my pet's gonna need it, but they don't. I mean, if think about those Florida Keys animals, they're not getting any type of brumation. Maybe it's a slight, you a know. A Florida brumation, you know, going down to 60 instead yeah, of 80. Right. For like, one night randomly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you don't have to, and I don't, I don't brumate any of my babies. And I was explaining to Dan earlier that that's less of, you know, it doesn't have to do with that being natural because it's not. It's definitely more natural to brumate your babies every year. But that's for me to get some size on animals and make sure that they're going to be healthy and make sure that they're going to be breeding in an appropriate time that keeps me um, honestly competitive with all the morph stuff and things like that. And so that's just kind of a choice. If you have one pet corn snake, you don't have to brumate it. Just keep it, keep it normally all year round. And listen, if you have a female, once she reaches three years, she may still cycle. I mean... Uh, that girl is a retired breeder of ours. So once, once an animal is a retired breeder, I usually don't cycle them anymore. And that's just because she had a prolapsed oviduct, which means that you have two oviducts, but she's missing one of them. And I don't know which one would work whichever <laughs> time. So if she happened to put out slugs, I would be afraid that she was right. in more danger. So I don't want to brumate her. Um, not because she's not able to roommate all the other stuff because I don't want her to cycle and and I don't really want people's pet corn snake to cycle because even just passing slugs puts the animal at risk. Right, yeah, that's no reason to do it. Plus yeah. it takes something out of their body. They have to produce all that calcium and everything else and and, and I know some level. And I know that after my female lays eggs I need to give her meals probably every three to four days just to get her caught up but maybe a pet owner doesn't yeah. know that. So therefore they may still be doing every two to three weeks and you may have an animal that's underweight. Right. So, but yeah, you don't, you don't have to brumate your pet. Probably, probably best not to, because why, why go through all the trouble? Why try to find a place the that's ideal in your house? house right. and... Now, when you're brumating, do you, is there like the same size requirements as a normal cage or do you keep them in a smaller space just to kind of keep them? less active what are you what are you usually doing there so i think a lot of people and i've seen a bunch of people like cohabitate during brumation or they feel like it's not as big of a deal because the animal's not moving around um i don't do that i don't have a problem with that that seems to work as well people seem to put them in darking you know dark tubs put them downstairs and all that good stuff uh, i don't really overthink it so I usually use what I would keep an adult in, which is typically uh, 32 cord. That's what that one's called, right? The Saturday's one. Yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> I just wanted to... <laughs> but it's, it's the one below 41 cord. But uh, I believe it's 32 or 28 or somewhere around there. But uh, basically their regular adult enclosure, that's what I would keep them in. I just put a top on it. Um, you know, before they go down, I put fresh water in there. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. They're, uh, I try to keep them in their same enclosure and all that good stuff. I will re I will clean them right before they go down and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. But they're not going to the bathroom as much as normal or if they go to the bathroom, that's, Ooh, so I totally, I totally forgot to talk about that is that you actually need to wait for them to clear out. So if you, after you feed them, you want to give probably two to three weeks. I usually err on the side of caution three weeks to make sure that they clear out. If they still have, you know, a prey item in there that they have to digest, 
they will potentially die mm. because you know that prey item will basically just stagnate in there right. and will eventually rot and then get into their intestines mm. and you know they get yeah, something I would have not known. I mean, it makes total sense, obviously, but I wouldn't have thought That's actually it. super important. <laughs> like, I totally blanked out. Rewind, rewind, edit, yeah. put this in put the this beginning. In the beginning. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like the most important thing, not to kill all your animals. Yeah. So, so that's really important. And they do have a fast metabolism, so like right. two to three weeks is more than enough time. You imagine, know, it's imagine not a short tail. Imagine roommate short tails, you have to start like prepping in April. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, now we're going to wait a year. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a nightmare. So it's like, yeah, and that that is one of the dangers of brumating. It's something that you wanna you wanna keep a close eye on. And I, I've heard people even when they bring them up, uh, too soon feeding, too frequently, maybe a little bit too more, much stress on their system. Oh really? Um, I don't see that as much, but I do give them a settling in period once I bring them up and I put them into the room. I usually give them you know five to seven days to acclimate, and then I start to go to feeding. Well, it makes sense. Like I was talking to you earlier about that, you know, that rescue snake that I had to feed slow because his body wasn't used to processing. So now their body's not processing in a while. So it makes sense to kind of give him something to get him in gear and then start, you know, rolling instead of just hit the ground totally running. You know, yeah, and that's, that makes some sense for sure. Except they are such psychos when they come out of the Oh, nation. they're different like, I mean, We always are like, oh, corns are so tame. Corns are so docile, you know. They'll never strike at you. They'll never jump out. All those things go out the window when you're taking them out of rumination, which makes sense, you yeah, know. They've got to be on hyperdrive to go get a meal. <laughs> yeah. Jailbreak. Hey, how are I you? locked her in the kitchen and she <laughs> got out. She wouldn't go upstairs. She didn't want to leave the party all the well, way. Let's see if she'll at least stay if she sits Can we fit three people and a dog Ooh. on this couch? <laughs> Oh, look at that. Aww. Part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like I was saying, they are such different animals when they come out of rumination. Like, I'm definitely, that's my most cautious period when I'm handling them. Or even just opening the tubs when we take them. Yeah, let's be honest. I'm not handling most of them <laughs> because, and, and in the wild, you think about, they just, they just starved. And up here, you know, those animals that are in New Jersey, I can imagine that it's a good five months before, yeah. you know, the last time they've had a meal if they're lucky right and so it's like yeah that animal is ready to yeah, eat now if they're warmed up and their metabolism's fast it's gonna be they have to get a meal on them pretty quick and so anything that goes in front of their face may potentially be food and therefore you know they may give it a shot so now how long does that last do you feel like it's a time period a certain number of meals is it just getting that initial meal like when do they kind of, i'm sure it's individual chill out females and females like eggs <laughs> they get <laughs> They can be a little bit squirrely all throughout. It depends, you know, it does depend on how much they've had, how much food they've had, their body condition after coming into brumation. And none of this stuff is static. It's always something that you need to look at the animal and kind of determine as far as how much you're going to feed them. You always want to look at body condition. So, yeah, I have certain animals that I know that, and it must be their just their general natural attitude. And then some animals that I know it took a little bit more out of them and they really need to go. And then there's other animals that are chill all the time or ones that have great body condition and don't have a crazy food driver that don't have a great body condition but still don't have Yeah, I've, I've noticed um, like certain females I have, like they'll lay eggs and it'll look like you could breed her right there again. Like her body looks great. And then you see the other ones where it's like, you know, she looks like she just rolled out of like, you know, prison where she has not been. <laughs> she's like, you know, crazy thin. So it's weird. And, you know, I don't really know yeah, like what determines, like, yeah. if it's something to do with the genetics, if it's something to do with just how she was fed. But, you know, I feed all my females somewhat consistently. Um, I vary everything, obviously, based on, you know, activity level and age and size and all that. But... You know, consistent enough to where you wouldn't think it would be that drastic going through the same process, uh, but it is pretty crazy. You know, my, my T-positive female, she laid 24 eggs, which is like a huge clutch for blood pythons, and she looked ready to breed coming out of that. So like, you know, it was wild. I, like two meals into the season and she was like prime body weight again. And it's like, wow. And then I remember like one of my short tails, like 
you could feel like your hand go inside, like there was nothing. Yeah, like, there's like that vacuum yeah, on there when they like nothing the in eggs. there when she was done. I'm like, oh my god, like, I want to feed you right now while you're done laying eggs. That's so scary because I used to when I bred ball pythons, I took them by like the first uh, third of their body and lift them up just to see their general condition. Some of them had that suck in yeah. their stomach, and you're like, oh man, that really took a lot out of you. Yeah. So that, that I also use that as a basis too. Like I try not to go back to back years anyways with any any girls. Um, I do do it on occasion. Like that T positive girl, I didn't. I didn't have a male that I wanted to put to her the following season, but she would have been one that I would have been willing to do it. But if they look like that, or it really took a lot out of them, I like to give them that year to reset. And that's like, the same mentality for like double clutching. In okay. court. I don't I don't go for double clutches pretty much ever. I, don't, I mean, I think we have accidental double clutches, right. but if you feed them and stuff, you can get them going. But uh, yeah, that is, that is something about plumage is that you can have those double clutches if you feed a bunch. But I don't see that that's exactly necessary. And I think something that's interesting is that corn's in the wild. Every study that I've been able to find says about, the clutch size is about five to 16 eggs. If you talk to any corn snake breeder, <laughs> their clutches are about 30 eggs. And quite frankly, I feed mine a bit less, and I usually have, our clutches are usually eight to 16 eggs. Um, usually a lot of them probably fall into that 12, and it really depends, like that three-year-old female will throw six, okay. that four-year-old female will throw nine, and then that next year she'll throw 12, and it's like this steady progression that just seems to be more natural in my opinion. Yeah. And so I've approached, I approach most things on comparing, comparing what the animal is doing in nature as far as um, where they don't have food availability every week. Right. I think that's important to know. And I mean, and that's, that's happened in pythons and boas, you know, very consistently. Um, or now people are getting on the, on the train of feeding less and stuff like that, but it has not happened in colubrids because the more you feed colubrids, the more they produce, and that's 100%. The more you put in, the more you get out, and uh, I would rather sacrifice production, to be honest, to have yeah. a long-lived, healthy animal. I'm the same way, too, because like, even though I breed my animals, they're pets first and foremost, and like I want them around for 30 years. You know, I don't yeah. want them to be baby factories, because you look at a lot of these, these breeders that do stuff at least with Python, which is what I'm more familiar with, those snakes are dying at 10, 11, 12 years old in a lot of cases. Like, yeah, they're making their money off of them and then they're gone, and so they're, they're happy with that, but that's not that's not the angle that I think people should be going for, and it's certainly not what I want to do, you know? Um, so, like, I have snakes that I've had, you know, at breeding age for, like, six years that have only had, like, one or two clutches just wow. because, like, I don't want that for them. Like I, they throw great babies. They do everything great. It's nothing to do with that. I just want them to, to do it. And I, I let them tell me to, to some extent. Um, like Sam Buka is a good example. My big chrome female. She's one of those girls that she wants to breed, and she's not taking no for an answer. And like she will get super moody and super impatient if you don't let her. But like she had what two years in a row, and she was trying to push for the third year. And I'm like, no, you know, at some point I have to step in and be your brain for a minute like put your foot you know, down yeah you will not you went, make more babies you went two years in a row you need and i ended up giving her two years off which she was not happy about um but then she came back and she had another great clutch uh so it, it seems to work and everybody thinks you have to keep everything fat and i know you said mm -hmm. like with them the more you feed them the more you get out those guys it's not always like that some of the short tails yeah. you will but like the bloods you don't you just get them to a point where they become unproductive instead of productive. And you guys had to get to that point to know that, but these guys are so hardy, they never yeah. get to that point, it seems like. They'll just always go, and I believe that not second clutching is part of what keeps, you know, it allows me to give them that good rebound as well as, I never I never worry about doing two years in a row. Colubrids seem to be built for that. Yeah. For whatever reason, they do just fine. Well, you think with their faster metabolism, that also probably means they're recovering quicker, like everything in their mm -hmm. system is going to move quicker. Um, you know, whereas like bloods and shorts, you know, everything's slow. Um, so some of them will take a while to really recover that weight. And if you have a girl that doesn't lay until July, and now October, November rolls around, and they're starting to cycle, like you don't want to breed this thing again that fast, you know, most of the time. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, double clutching is probably something these guys 
do just trying to keep the species going, like trying to put out as much as they can. Yeah, and like keep in mind that the, the gestation period is so much different. You know, in pythons, you may have, um, when's like, how long does it take you from, from the post ovulation shed to like getting eggs? It varies. Um, typically, you know, like the, the model would be about 90 days, but you know, I've had girls go 50, 50 something days before they lay after shed. I've had girls lay, you know, 23 days after shed. Mm -hmm. And then, depending on what temperature you incubate at, usually the eggs are going to hatch somewhere between like day 55 and, and like 64. Um, I, I, where I keep my incubator at, I pretty much steadily will see like an early pip at like 58 and then, you know, like 61, 62 is when there's really like an exodus of everybody coming out. Um, I don't cut though, so like I know a lot of people see the first pip and then mm -hmm. cut, I don't, I just let them roll. So. It's, it's weird too doing that because you see sometimes they'll hatch like 10 days apart and they're in the same egg box and it's like you wonder if you were, when we're cutting like maybe you're cutting way too early because that egg for whatever reason didn't develop as fast as this one and I don't understand enough to know why that happens but obviously mm -hmm. the conditions are the same so it's something to do with the development of that egg um, but I've also heard some guys talk about like you know the egg tooth that these guys get falls off very quickly mm -hmm. And it's also very easy for a snake to start trying to pip and that egg tooth falls uh -huh. off and now it's, it's screwed. So I don't really fault people for cutting either, but there is a difference between like putting in a slit for survival and like the drop top, blood everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely different levels of cutting and that you should never be like making that bloody nasty egg. Like that's just not, that blood's supposed to be there for a reason and now it's, it's gone. Plus, if you cut that egg that was supposed to sit in there for another five days, or six days. Now you're running the risk of going septic because now all that's leaking into there. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to, you know. Because if, if you watch, and I don't know if you, I mean, you haven't done pythons, I don't think, right? Well, you did balls. Have, yeah. Um, so like when snakes naturally pip, it seems to be like within 24 hours they pip and they're out. Right. But when you cut, they might sit in there for six days sometimes before they actually exit the egg. So they seem to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I like to just kind of let them roll and I've, I've had good success. I had a clutch hatch when I was at Timley. I wasn't even home, came back, you know, all 17 hatched on their own and were out and wanted to kill me. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine 10 days in between one egg. It's like, like crazy. I would be losing my mind. Yeah. I mean, we wait like two days and we're freaking out. Like, yeah, why yeah. aren't the rest out? They should all be out by oh, now. Oh, definitely. Like, it's, it's, I'd be freaking out. But 10 days in between? Yeah. I think the longest I've had personally is probably eight. I think 56 to 64 is the longest I've had within a clutch. But then I've also had two clutches that were in the same spot in the incubator set up the same way. And like one clutch, the whole clutch was out by day 60. And the next one, everything was out like 66. And it's just... Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's got to be something that's going on when they're in the female's body that sends them out in a different stage, I guess. Well, colubras, we get to we get to manipulate the temperatures more. So my my record was 96 days, <laughs> and and then but the normal is like 60 to 64 days. That's pretty typical. But uh, yeah, so it's 96 like 96 very long. Patiently waiting, we did not pick. And you can like incubate at cut. 75 we... degrees, or you can incubate at, ah, uh, well, once you get into the upper 80s, you're really, you're really pushing it, but now, maybe like 82 degrees. Some people have said that, um, you know, incubating with, with python eggs, like lower temperatures, you get like bigger, more robust mm -hmm. babies. You notice anything like that in colubrids, or is it pretty consistent? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's dangerous at, at either extreme, so... You'll see some kinking, whether it be at the very low temperature or the very high temperature. It seems like you've seen to get some some um, kinking as well as you may get things like stillborns. Okay. Um, I prefer to be in the middle there. If you if you go too hot, you will get smaller babies that seem to be harder to feed. But I've always had, uh, or people say are harder to feed. But I always had success with those babies, as well I've as never gone too too hot. Right. Yeah, really, we always stay about 80 degrees, 80 to 82 degrees. It's fine with me. Yeah, I like, to, I like to err on that side of caution, too, because then if something happens, it gives you more wiggle room, whether you get a temperature spike or a temperature drop, like you have a few degrees cushion. Like you see people that, that incubate stuff like close to 90, and I'm like, you have so little room for error. 
you know, all of a sudden the sun shines wrong in your house. And like now, you're, <laughs> now your incubator, you know, the incubator can't cool itself. So now mm -hmm. it's, it's going to retain that heat. Like I have to run my air conditioner when my incubator's on because my house will, the sun hits my house and it'll raise the temperature so rapidly that it affects the incubator. So even though the incubator's thermostatted and it'll cut the heat off, you know, it's on a helix, but it can't lose any heat out of there. So the room getting so much warmer affects it. So I, uh, I put the air conditioner on, I put it on like a setting to where if the room gets like over 80, it'll kick on. And uh, that seems to work and keep my incubator consistent. But that's one of those things like the first season, I didn't expect that. Like, you mm -hmm. know, that's one of those things nobody ever told me, like, you really have to watch that. You know, you expect it's on a thermostat, it's gonna it's control itself. Right. But it's so well insulated that- It just stays in there, yeah. even when it kicks off. I think a lot of people, at least in the last year, when we've talked to about incubation and things like that, they say they'll have a fan and the heater yep, yep. in their room just to cover both sides of it. If yeah. Anything happens. Yeah, my problem is, is my house mostly is just uh, my, my attic's not insulated. So when that sun beats, you know, and you get that like spring, early summer sun that's like really strong. My house can go from like 63 degrees to like 83 wow. by the end of the day if you don't do anything to manage it. Um, even if it's only 70 outside, it's just how strong the sun is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I found that that works for me. But it's, it's interesting the things you learn that like nobody told you that you didn't expect to have to kind of learn on the fly. Mm -hmm. And so now it's like, even though it's April and it's not hot out, I have to have my AC on just to keep that from happening. That's crazy. Yeah, yep. it's always it's always easier too, it seems to warm up, especially with the with the uh, technology that we have in snakes. We often just do heat tape on thermostats. We never, we never have any controlled cooling. No. So yeah, so that's a situation where it's so hard to keep that in, yeah. in control. So like I said, I have this, the main snake room is insulated, so that one stays pretty in control, but my incubator's too big to fit to the doorways. So it came in the door to my house and went just next to the door. It's like right there. We had to take the doors off the house. Oh, gosh. It took like three of us to get it in there. It's an awesome incubator, but I remember thinking if I ever move, I'm like, I don't want to move this thing. It's an old Pepsi fridge. It's like one of the huge full-size ones. Mm -hmm. And I have a house that was built in the 40s, so my doorways are, are small. Not meant for know? big things. No, nobody was planning on bringing a Pepsi cooler. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we got it right in the door and it's right next to it. So it's like literally in the middle of my living room. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Especially when I'm not using it. There's just like this big empty fridge. People come over the house that like what is don't it? know what's going on. They're always like, okay, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the coolest part about Calubra is, especially if you're keeping ambient, is the fact that your ambient temperature is going to be the same temperature that you can incubate your eggs in. And I think people... People have told me like when we post something on social media and I'd be like, yeah, we're incubating eggs right now. And it's like, they're like, well, you don't have an incubator. You're not incubating. Well, no, that's what's happening. I mean, they're, <laughs> incubation they're is still a process. incubating no matter what. Yeah. But so if, if a snake's doing maternal incubation, you're still it's not, not incubating. incubating? Like, no. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, luckily, Calubras, and if you don't have a room that's heated up, you can put them on top of the fridge and they'll usually... You'll, you'll get those like 80 day clutches that way and you'll have babies that come out that are doing great. So it's really, um, you know, it's something that if you have kids or anything like that, even the Python people, like if you have kids and you want something simple as far as, uh, you know, low maintenance, you can just set them up. And the cool thing about Clubridge is that when you pair them up, you literally just put them in a bin and then you can see them interact with each other. They'll jockey for a position and then they'll breed. Like, it's a much more immediate, you know, situation with you. You're probably putting these animals in. You're, like, sneaking in, like, yeah, four so hours sometimes later. Sometimes it's, like, two days before you <laughs> see anything. Um, one of my males, Tux, is, he's, like, the record. Like, he gets in there, and uh, if he's really on a female, he'll be locked up within, like, 15 minutes. He's, like, super fast. Um, same with my male water python. When they actually do lock, like, he, he's rapid fire. But then I'll have some that are like so sneaky, like my ocelot male. I've only seen him lock once ever, but he's produced offspring, so he yeah. does it. But he's just like super secretive, and he yeah. must like wait till like does it with the lights off type yeah. of thing, yeah. You know, and I try to go in there in the middle of the night and catch him, and not that I caught him one time. Well, with the with the colubrids, it actually matters how old they are. So it's like that that two year old male, which is really when the earliest we want to breed males you'll see that it takes him a little while to build up confidence to know what he's doing you'll see that 
that male that's about six years old who knows what he's doing. It's kind of a low level rapey experience, more so Let's than the male. Say that on YouTube. <laughs> That's well, us. I mean, <laughs> it's not made for kids. This isn't gonna. Yeah, no, it's no. not gonna set off the the COPA law or whatever. We're not gonna find words. Other words, you, many other words you could have said. Well, <laughs> the 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 male like it's he tries forcible. to he tries to court her <laughs> and be nice and do all this other stuff. He put an old guy in there, and even that goes for an old female. She's like, I know the drill. Let's, yeah, you know, and she's ready. I, to I noticed that even with the pythons, like the ones that like. You don't do anything. They run the show. They know what's going on. You pair them up. There's no, like, racing around. There's no nothing. Like, they just get mm -hmm. down to business and whatever. And, yeah, so you definitely, definitely, I, I notice that with age. There's definitely more confidence and more kind of just they'll handle the process. You don't really have to do anything. Sometimes I think mm -hmm. we just need to step back more and just let them, let them do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the cool thing is, other than just literally physically putting them together and you can see them breed right there and you know if they're going or they're not going at this very moment is the fact that like everything happens so quickly like mm -hmm. after that after that lockup they'll so go into nice. shed and then eggs are there like two weeks later oh wow and you're like and the that that breeding may happen for like three weeks or so and you may get a few pairings or maybe even four weeks maybe a month but after that that, that pre-lay shed, it happens within like two weeks, and then you get you have eggs. Like, it seems like just as soon as the breeding season starts, sometimes it's over. Oh, yeah. not no. That, that. See, not not for the pythons, man. Like, I start in October, and sometimes there's still stuff going on in July. And like you're at you're at the mercy of your female. Like it seems oh, yeah. like they they'll just ovulate at different times. The corns, it's like it's a window, you know, because because the brumation's so hard. Yeah. It seems like it completely resets their system. It puts everyone on the same loop. Yeah. Then you decide to he was thinking about not be nice anymore. He was thinking about trying a taste test. Well, it's the a king snake. Oh, one hundred percent. I felt them start pushing, start manipulating. <laughs> if if no one's comes. if no one's owned a king snake, <laughs> just like give them enough time, and they will find some part of you to try to eat. Yeah, <laughs> they are just super food aggressive, and it it just doesn't matter to them. Randomly, they'll just bite you. Oh, yeah. you've been holding me, but I still. It's not like yeah, it's not like the food response that you break with a hook or anything like that, and then you take them out and they're good. No, it's like I said, that's my olives. They don't like. I mean, they do have a food response they in their cage, very similar. but it's like all of a sudden in the middle of handling, they're just like, oh, this this is soft. Let me bite this and wrap you. <laughs> Never and trust like, them, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. This pine is literally a stone. I, I it, can't believe how good it hasn't it moved been. at all. And it was funny when she got closer to him, or you you hit his tail with his elbow. He tensed up a bit, and then he chilled out of it. And then he did it a couple of times. We go. I thought for I sure the dog pet. was going to set him off, and then he handled it pretty well. Because so... he was definitely more nervous upstairs when I had him on earlier. You could see him definitely more reactive to everything. Yeah, I've been trying to like very purposefully get try to have a tame louisiana pine because because uh, the parents are not <laughs> the parents are not and not many of them are at least in this line it seems like they're super super defensive and if people don't know they do a what people consider like a rattlesnake mimic which would be they rattle their tail they hiss you know they s up in that classic pose and uh, that's what all my all my adults do that, and even the female of this guy does this, or the female from this clutch does this. The and, female of this guy. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> of the same lineage, uh, they all, uh, yeah. And this guy has been good so far, and I think it's because I've been actively working with them. And I know, so I know some people say a snake's a snake; you can't tame them down, and that is true to a certain extent. I know those animals. It, don't try to tame down your white lip. I mean, it will <laughs> probably just stress it out to yeah. the point where it dies. Nope, I mean, that's, that's why not... I'm just hands off with her as much as I can be. And but it's like a corn snake; it starts off terrible. You may be able to get it accustomed to yeah. you more. So she's also older. I got her as an adult, so you also lose that period of time mm -hmm. where they're kind of formulating their opinions on their surroundings. Yeah, I think that was an interesting thing that I was talking with with Riley Jimison recently. It was like, can you have like a traumatically damaged snake? And yes. I know, and I and I think that like Kevin McCurley has talked about that too. I think as well. It seems as though things can happen during a formative period that can really turn a snake on or off. So I've had snakes in the past that were some were either touch and go with me, or some were great with me, and then something happened. 
Uh, in one case, I took this snake outside for pictures and she got super nervous outside. So she didn't do anything out there, but you could just see her body language like she was freaked out. So I took her back inside and when I went to put her back in her cage, she got into that like comfortable area and that's when she reacted and like freaked out. So she jumped, like literally jumped, I know she didn't have legs, but out of the cage, tried to stuff herself into places, mm. striking at me. I'm trying to get her back into the cage. She's musking, she's mm. biting, she's thrashing, like everything. And I ended up having to like trap her underneath of a tub let her settle a little bit and then transfer her uh -huh. into her cage. From that day forward, I could never touch that snake again. Like she was stressed out, she would wow. open her mouth, she would like actually spit, she would get herself so upset. And like, even though like she freaked out and I was just trying to protect her from herself, in her mind, like I hurt her and that's it. Like she would never trust me again. Other people could go near her, I could not. Like there was wow. a definite wall there. That was a snake that used to sit in my lap and be fine. And years of nothing gone in a matter of like three minutes where she just never trusted me again. Um, so I definitely think that they can definitely remember bad experiences and associate it with something. I don't know what level, you know, sticks and doesn't or how you go. Yeah, I don't know anyone could ever prove one way or another. Right. You know, you know what, exactly. what information we have now, you can't. But I can tell you that that animal went night and day, you know. Yeah. And then Raven... I mean, I have pictures of me like laying with my head on her, like she was great. She laid a clutch of eggs and she's been a different animal ever since. That's another thing. You pump the hormones in there, whatever, the, that cycling can also turn yeah. an animal into so a different animal. So now she's actually gone after me a few times. She's come back over her body to go after me. Every time I take her out of her cage or put her back, it's like she's much more stressed than she wow. used to be. And then you wonder too, like you think, is there any traumatic experience with like taking the eggs away from her? Like she went through all this, she laid her eggs and now I came in and I just took them. Like, is there any memory in their mind about that? Like, obviously there's plenty of snakes I've done that with and are fine, but that was her first clutch and she like really mm -hmm. took it hard. I had to bathe her a couple times to get her back on food. Like she really, really stressed. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Like we don't know their mental capacity for that kind of stuff. And right. I, don't, I don't think of it as, you know, she's like all oh, my babies, but I just think of it as she relates all that traumatic, traumatic. To, to that situation. Um, but I've definitely seen some changes like that. And I've seen physical changes in snakes after laying a clutch too. Um, one of my big blood females, she, uh, she hasn't had a good shed in like three years and she used to shed perfect. Wow. Hmm. And I've thrown everything in the book at her. I've gotten to the point to where morning and night i scrub out her water dish and change it twice a day like making sure she's got clean water and hydrated i've soaked i've sprayed i've done like seven different types of substrate substrate combinations nothing works cool. nothing and it was just literally from her pre-lay shed was fine and then for three years every single shed since has been terrible wow that's so and weird. i've never bred her again and like you know we talked about if i bred her would that hormone change maybe kick her body back to where it was? Would it make it worse? Like, I don't know, but I haven't wanted to breed her until I see a couple of good sheds so I know like her body's working. And her last two have been the best she's had in three years. Like the one that she had most recently, she had maybe like what equates to like a six inch square piece total on her body, mm -hmm. um, which is night and day. I mean, she was at the point where she would like shed part of her head and that was it. She wouldn't shed anything else. Wow. It would all be stuck. And I thought first couple times, like, oh, maybe she's just being lazy and whatever. But it was it's something changed in her body. And I don't know what it is. Wow. Yeah, it's weird the things you, you learn over time and you keep a lot of animals and work with enough. Like, you just see things that you can't necessarily explain. Like, I don't know what happened, but we know, mm -hmm. you know, from humans that sometimes people have babies and then their body completely changes in one way or another. Yeah. You know, anything from diabetes pops up sometimes. So, like, things that just, you know, oh, totally such deserve. random things. Like, your hair changes. I feel like your feet change. Like, super random things yeah. that don't seem to be connected. Right. But somehow they are. So, I don't, you know, want to anthropomorphize and be like, oh, what happens to humans? It happens to them. But it makes sense that, you know, all that hormone production and all that, oh, yeah. you know, bodily stress could definitely change some of the things. And... You know, recently with the, the Burmese pythons, learning that their, their genes actually change when they eat. 
and then they go back. Really? Yeah, the genes themselves change. So their organs are, are doubling in size and it's because it's changing the genetic code for them to grow larger, but just temporarily. That's crazy. And like, so if that's happening just from eating, yeah, what is egg yeah. production in that process doing like that we don't know? So, and think about the stress that that causes on that animal. And that's why I said like it takes two weeks for their bodies to go back to normal. And so if you're feeding that snake every week or even every two weeks, you may it's be never, compounding ever... stress though yeah. also because because yeah. because its organs are expanding every time it eats. Yeah. As well as the fact that it just passed eggs. As a, yeah. So it's like hard to. So I think, like I think that's why you notice a lot of females while they're having egg production, most things will stop eating. There's some that won't individuals, but by and large, a lot of them stop eating. So you got to think their body knows like. Let's let this process happen before we jump into that. Into just, that one. just too much energy. And like snakes eat and shed in captivity, but I don't think it happens as often in the wild because they're kind of dormant during that time. We're offering them food, but I don't I don't feed and shed if I can avoid it because I don't think it's it's ideal for them either. Their body's mm -hmm. going through a tough process, and then you're adding another tough process on top of it. It just seems like you know that's kind of putting them through more than they're designed for at once. You know, I have no proof of that or anything. It's just my opinion, but I and try not to feed stuff. Heavier animals may not, especially pythons and clovers, will eat any anything yeah. anytime. But like, you know, they may not eat anyway. I mean, when I had ball pythons, you know, half of them didn't eat and shed, whatever. It's, it's Maybe funny. that is. I had I had one that I fed in shed when I had ball pythons. She would only eat frozen thawed when she was in shed. If she wasn't in shed, she wouldn't take frozen Because she thawed. can't see to know the she, yeah. difference. So she had no idea. There was like, she couldn't smell it, whatever it was. So once again, weird things you learn. Uh, anything else you want to add before we cut this off? Yeah, I think I should just do it uh, in order once in a very succinct <laughs> because thing. Because you I feel bad things. and the important thing before. Okay. Yeah, yeah, part of that. So, all right. Numero uno. Numero uno is that you've, after you feed your animal, you wait at least two to three weeks for it to clean out. Yes, so you want to see that it's going to the bathroom, and in colubrids, sometimes one meal can equal three poops. It's all over the place. It's not exactly one for one, like sometimes it is in other species or other uh, clades of snake. Is that the way, right way to say it? Clades? Clades? Never heard sure. that word. Sure, let's go with it. Okay, and a little dose. It'll catch up. Yeah, there, there you go. We started a new thing. And then uh, November, Thanksgiving, whenever you want to start it, I bring them into the hallway and then eventually in 24 hours or so, I bring them down into what is our basement or whatever it can be, 50 to 60 degrees. You really want to shoot for more of uh, 55 is usually ideal, 50, 55. And then I do that all the way up until February. But I, I feel like you need a good solid like two months or so, I would say. Um, I'm sure people can do it a lot shorter than that, whatever, but I feel like two months is reasonable. And then I bring them up, and I bring them up to room temperature. I do that for about a day, and then I throw them into the snake room, which is 80 to 82 ambient, which is what I keep them on with no hot spot. And then that female, after probably two to three weeks, I can't remember offhand, but she will go through a shed cycle, and then after that shed cycle, that's when you start bringing her some males. You, you're also feeding her, you know, that first week out of brumation, and then you're, you're hitting her pretty hard every four days, and then you spread it out to a week, depending on body condition. Uh, and I never go to I never go to rats. I'm just giving her some uh, some regular adult mice. Uh, every few days, I'd rather do more often smaller meals than uh, than something like a rat. So, but if I have a female that's really struggling, a rat might get her over that hump. As far as they'll they'll put on body condition real fast with a fatty rat. I think that's pretty much it. All right, yeah. perfect. Well, thank you guys. We'll see you. Woo. <laughs> this guy in a little air time. <laughs>